I will give you the title of the sermon up front. Come out of her, my people. Come out of her, my people. This very statement is only mentioned in those exact words one place in the Bible. And I will not go there in the beginning of the sermon, but I will keep your suspense and go there last because I want to build a message around that very statement, come out of her, my people. Uh, when you study the Bible and you understand the Bible and you put it together for its meaning and its ultimate theme, you know that God dealt and has dealt with two different peoples, two different nations. And I will talk about that subject today. There is the implicit meaning throughout the Bible that we are told to as Christians, disciples of Christ, to come out of her. And my purpose today, you might say my specific purpose statement as we say in a message, is to talk about that meaning of these words and what it means to come out of her, my people. We do see, if we consider those words right up front, that those words in my mind imply action. That's one of the first things that comes to mind with myself, is that it implies action. And it's a very personal, personal message from God himself, instructing someone to come out of what? And, to my mind, it means to put distance, to separate and it also tells me that we are to be different. I think we all know that by now, most of us in this room, certainly the ones who God has called and we've come to that repentant stage and been baptized and received the Holy Spirit, that we know that we are to be different from the world around us. And that is the implicit theme again throughout the scriptures. And when you study God's word, we understand that. Before talking about us, though, I want to go back and talk about them just a little. I want to talk about those that came before us long ago. Ancient Israel. You see, the Bible is a book when you consider the way the Bible is made up. It's two books, two stories, two testaments, two covenants. Someone said recently in a message, yes, there's different covenants in the Bible, but the Bible by and large and in its basic layout is about two covenants, the old covenant and the new covenant, where God has dealt with two nations, two peoples, physical Israel and what we've long termed as spiritual Israel, the church. You will not find the term spiritual Israel in the Bible, but we know and understand that when we use that term spiritual Israel, we're talking about the church, the call out ones, ecclesia, and we talk about ancient Israel, the physical birthright people, the sons of Jacob. So I want to talk about that first covenant just a little bit, those that God had called at that time to be his own special people with a very special calling. And so I could quote, which I'm sure all of you are very familiar with, Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 6. I will quote some of these verses today. You can jot them down. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 6. As he told Moses to tell Israel, for you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. God called a people called Israel. And he started with a man named Abram, as we know, when he made that covenant with Abram and then later Abraham and then later to the sons of Jacob as it came on down through Isaac and Jacob and to the sons of Jacob. And they became known as the nation of Israel. And God gave a very special calling to that nation of Israel. In fact, the whole Old Testament is built around that story, that testimony to God's love, his favor to that special nation that he had called. And we know, and if you understand the scriptures, we know that that call is still ongoing. That call has not been rescinded. God in dealing with special love and favor to Israel 
And I think sometimes, again, to mention, we think of the word grace, that word grace in the New Testament, Old Testament, the Greek and the Hebrew, simply means favor. God found grace in Israel, gave them his grace, extended his grace to them. He has extended his grace to us, spiritual Israel, we call ourselves at times, the saints of God. And his grace is nothing more than his favor. So God did something very special with the nation Israel, as he called them long ago, to be his own special begotten people at that time. You can jot down Leviticus chapter 26, verse 11 and 12. Leviticus chapter 26, verse 11 and 12, where God said, I will set my tabernacle among you, and my soul shall not abhor you. I will walk among you and be your God, and you shall be my people. What an intimate, intimate thought process that the God of heaven told a nation that you shall be mine. You shall be a treasure unto me. You shall be a kingdom of priests. That's actuality what he was saying to them. God had big plans, as we might say, for Israel. But something happened along the way, did it not, with that nation. If you're very familiar with the Old Testament, you understand what went wrong. It wasn't God that moved, Israel moved. God never moves. He's constant. He's always constant. He remains the same yesterday, today, forever. So if you're ever looking around and thinking, something seems to have moved around me, it's you. Because God main, remains very constant. God required of Israel. I am willing, he said in very plain English, to say it that way. I am very willing to extend my grace and favor upon you as a nation. I am willing to bless you beyond your wildest imaginations. I am willing to give you the land of milk and honey. I am willing to lead you, fight your battles. That and so much more that it would take sermons to go through. And I ask only in return, what? What did God ask in return? We find it in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your might. And Israel initially said at the ratification of the old covenant there in Exodus chapter 24, they initially said, this we will do. And what happened? They quickly began to have affairs with the other nations. Hosea, the book of Hosea, plainly a marriage covenant. And they broke the covenant, not God, but they. Ancient Israel broke the covenant with God. I do want you to turn to Leviticus chapter 20. Leviticus chapter 20. Read a few verses here. Again, God was making them, calling them out as his own special people to give them special favor, special blessings above all peoples of the earth. Did not mean that God did not love the other peoples of the earth, but he had called them to be a special kingdom unto himself, a very special people to himself. They were the firstborn. I hope that we always never lose sight that the fact that Israel was a firstborn to God among all nations and forever brethren will be a firstborn unto God. Israel will always be his firstborn among nations. And I plan when I come back here the next time to talk more about physical Israel and more about that later when I come back, God willing. Verse 22, Leviticus chapter 20. Hear God instructing through Moses, Israel, you shall therefore keep all my statutes and all my judgments and perform them that the land where I am bringing you to dwell may not vomit you out. And you shall not walk in the statutes of the nation which I am casting out before you, for they commit all these things, and therefore I abhor them. Verse 24, but I have said to you, you shall inherit their land, I will give it to you to possess a land flowing with milk and honey. I am the Lord your God who has separated you from the peoples. 
You shall therefore, verse 25, distinguish between clean beast and unclean, between unclean birds and clean, and you shall not make yourselves, uh, you shall not make yourselves abominable by beast or by bird or by any kind of living thing that creeps on the ground, which I have separated from you as unclean. In other words, do not touch that which is unclean. That can be theoretically in the physical or in the spiritual. And we certainly as new covenant Christians understand that just because something is out of a physical nature, it can be very unclean of a spiritual sense and nature. He goes on here, verse 26, and you shall be holy to me, for I am the, for I the Lord am holy and have separated you from the peoples that you should be mine. How much plainer can it be in our minds? Come out of her, my people. Even though those words are not expressly voiced that way, the whole implicit message is to be you separate, to come out from the world, to come out from the nations around you, to be different from them. Don't want to be like them. See, Israel wanted to be like the nations around them. Remember, Israel wanted the king over them, just like all the nations around them. They wanted to be like Everyone around them. And God had expressly said, you shall be different. You shall come out from her. You shall be my own holy anointed nation. But Israel didn't want the things of God. They only wanted the things of the flesh. And we see that all through her history. Well, ancient Israel, we also find in Isaiah chapter 52 verse 11. Isaiah chapter 52 verse 11. We find the words here, inspired here from this great prophet of God, where God speaking through Isaiah to Israel, depart, depart, go out from there, touch no unclean thing, go out from the midst of her, be clean, you who bear the vessels of the Lord. And much more than even that, Israel was to be special holy vessels unto God. And there again, they totally, totally fail in their mission. They fail in their calling before God. Finally, in Leviticus chapter 19, Leviticus chapter 19, verse 1 and 2, we find the admonition and the words of God to Moses to be spoken to Israel. You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. I mean, brethren, today and going back and doing just what I call a thumbnail sketch only, just this tiny little sketch of, of look back at ancient Israel, and it's all through the Old Testament, all through the Old Covenant, how God worked with a nation Israel, and that whole book, whole covenant, whole episode, whole story was God's special affection for Israel and how he tried to work with them to turn their hearts to him. And instead, the more it seemed that God tried to turn their hearts to himself, the more their hearts were turned to the things and the nations and the sins and transgressions and idolatries and all the things unclean in the world around them. Are you beginning to make spiritual connections already with some of the things I'm saying? Because I'm about to move to us. Spiritual Israel. The church. The saints of God. God said to Israel, I want you to be different than the world around you. I want you to come out of her. Be not partakers of her sins, her transgressions, those idolatrous things. Seek after my ways. Cleave unto me as your husband. Using that very much in the sense of what that covenant was again, which was a marriage covenant between God and Israel. And Israel broke that covenant. And just as in a physical marriage, when one violates that covenant of marriage and goes out and has a physical affair on the other mate, Israel did the same thing. And that's why he had Hosea to marry a harlot, Gomer, to picture the adultery of Israel when you study and read carefully the book of Hosea. And it's all through other passages of the Old Testament. Israel 
was always seeking other affairs aside from God. The second testament, second covenant, the new covenant, the second agreement that we call the new covenant made with the saints of God, you and I, the church, those in the body of Christ, the call out ones, because that again is what the Greek means. Call out one simply means, refers to ecclesia. That means God has called us. He's called you and I to be different. He's called you and I to come out of her, to come out of her idolatrous ways. Have you been noticing any idolatrous ways in the world and society anymore? Do we like the world around us? I'm not going to answer these questions in your mind. You have to answer them in your mind. Are you happy with the world around you? Or do you see things that is vex vexing your very spirit and soul? Some of you who are biblical students who really study the Bible, when I use that term vexed, there's a certain place in the Bible I'll go to later that that should have kicked something in your mind awake. Somebody else was vexed in his spirit at the world he saw around him. Go there later. Tell me what difference there is in this language from the Apostle Peter in 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 9 and 10. We've been here so many times over the many years and we shall probably go there again from time to time. And you tell me when I read these words of the Apostle Peter under the new covenant, a new agreement with another nation called spiritual Israel. The call out ones of God, Ecclesia, tell me what's any different than the language that God said to physical Israel in Deuteronomy. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. So how does that differ in language from what we read just a little bit ago of the writings of Moses where God inspired him? I've just flipped in my Bible. You can jot it down. I've just flipped back to Exodus 19. Exodus 19. They had come out of Egypt. Verse 5. Exodus 19 verse 5. God through Moses told Israel, Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, to all the earth is mine. And you, verse 6, shall be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And these are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. The same words that God inspired Moses to tell ancient Israel were the same words that God, by his spirit, instructed the apostle Peter to tell the church. The same implicit message come out of her. Be a special kingdom of priests unto me. Be a holy nation unto me. The same language. God doesn't ask for one response from one group of people and ask for another response from another group of people. Salvation carries the same message to all people and shall carry the same message to all people all through the history of salvation right on through the eighth day. Because salvation will be given to all men, that is opportunity for salvation will be given to all to choose eventually. By witness of our repentance, our baptism, and the receiving of the Spirit, we witness to the fact that repentance and baptism that we said to our Father and Jesus Christ, we do, I do, I do covenant to keep your testimonies to be, to be loyal to you, to be faithful unto you till death do us part. Because when we really deeply understand that we are in a marriage covenant, we are headed for a great wedding feast one day, brethren. The final consummation of us becoming 
his for eternity, his bride for eternity, will be the consummation carried out at what's called the wedding supper. It's real. It's coming. It will happen. I want to be there at that wedding supper. I want to be there and be a part of it. I hope you do as well. God's grace, when you understand God's grace, which is his favor, and when we understand the favor that he has given to you and I as the saints of God, when we understand the profound nature of our calling, when we understand that he has asked of us to give everything to him and to come out of her, to come out of this world that is so rapidly declining and dying around us. Now, just thinking in the moment of 1 John, the epistle, 1 John 2 there, verse 15, 16, 17, this world is passing away. I want to put a more punctual way to say that. This world is dying, and it's dying fast. And the morality and the spirituality is dying fast. Brethren, I say and announce to you today, we have a tremendous challenge on our hands. To preach the gospel now. That's another subject for another time. We have the greatest challenge now. To not only preach the gospel. And to make disciples that we've ever had. And I could do a two, three hour study on that. In a moment. Because I see the challenge. We the ministry. I think most of us in the ministry. Understand the challenges ahead of us. And they're daunting. And God says yet. Tell my people to come out of her. You're here today because God called you and says, come out of her, my people. He chose you and called you and placed you here and you're in the body of Christ. And you're here because you heeded the call. We distance ourselves from what? Sin. Sin. We distance ourselves from offenses that are contrary to God's ways, His laws, His commandments, His statutes, His testimonies. We put distance between ourselves and that which is unclean. And you can take that word unclean in your mind and spiritually dealing with it, you can take that word unclean and take it to the far limitations of how many things we don't touch that are unclean to us. God says, that is unclean, do not touch it. That is unclean, do not touch it. And what do we do sometimes as human beings? We want to touch it. We want to get up close and personal just a little bit to it. Because it feels good. Or it sounds good. We do that because we're human. Sins separate us from God. Sins, especially sins practiced. If you are guilty of sins practiced, then you are putting up an absolute wall of separation between you and God. I said sins practiced, knowingly, willingly. You are putting up a wall of separation between you and God. And not only a wall of separation, but a wall that will vent, you will quickly find yourself shut out from the very presence of God. We all sin by omission. God understands that. And he, his mercy will cover all of our sins of omission. Certainly when we repent. But God will not be patient and merciful to practicing sinners. Who will look sin in the eye and say, I want you more than I want you, God. I want you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, as you're turning there, if you note again today as you've been hearing that sense of urgency in my voice, in the columns I write, you got it. Because it is a time of urgency. It is a time for us to understand the times we're in and our spiritual houses must continue to be made strong. 2 Corinthians 6. Drop down to verse 14. 
breaking right into Paul's thoughts here to the church at Corinth. And before we read together, let me mention something. Oh, did the church at Corinth have their problems. We talk so much about Laodicea. And oh, how bad Laodicea is. We never seem to talk about how bad Corinth was with all their problems. And maybe sometimes we're kind of doing this. We're kind of patting ourselves on the back thinking, boy, we're not like that church Corinth was. Really? Really? Are we? Or do we have the same problems again that the church of Corinth had? I would say, yes, we do. We do. Verse 11. I'm sorry, verse 14. Paul says, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? You know, let's pause a moment. You know, sometimes we use that many times. If we counsel someone, someone is thinking about marrying someone, as we would use the terminology, outside the faith, outside the church, as we would say, we may turn and say, well, God says, Paul says, don't be unequally yoked with an unbeliever. And yes, that's what Paul is also talking about. But when you look at this verse, you can be unequally yoked in many different type situations. You can be unequally yoked in a whole myriad of ideals and things that you might be participating in. So when Paul says, don't be unequally yoked, notice the key to it. What does righteousness have with lawlessness? You may be going in the way of something that you shouldn't do and following along in some way of lawless commandment breaking or law breaking that you shouldn't be involved in. And so you have just become unequally yoked with God's righteousness. You have become yoked together with a false way of life, a wrong pursuit. So this carries a great latitude of spiritual wisdom and understanding to really grasp what Paul is saying here. So he goes on. Verse 15, what accord has Christ with Belial or what part has a believer with the unbeliever? Verse 16, what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Do you hear the same implicit message here to the church, the saints of God, spiritual Israel, if I may use that term again, as we heard to the same message he gave to ancient Israel? Yes, you do. See, Paul is going back and bringing out the same message that God gave to ancient Israel. And he's telling the church the same thing, giving the same message to come out of her. Be separate. Be not a part of who she is. That is the world. That is the things around you. <clears throat> it's okay to eat so much cherry pie and coconut cake. God doesn't want to deny us the good things in moderation. When God says come out of her, you have to, in your mind, each time, answer that in your mind from his teachings. Does it go contrary to God? Does it differ than what God has instructed us to do? So when you examine that meaning of come out of her, you have to always properly, spiritually cross every T, dot every I, properly spiritually punctuate and make sure that you're coming up with the right answer every time seeking the right answer, does it go contrary to God's will, to his nature? <clears throat> How many times do we ever stop to consider that it might go against the nature of God? Most times, if it doesn't say it black and white, we say, we're good to do that then. That's how we reason our minds, is it not? Well, let's see, black and white, it doesn't tell me that I can't do that. Well, do you ever ask yourself to raise the spiritual bar, to raise the spiritual understanding, to say, does it violate any principle of God? Oh, now you're in a big arena. Once you have gotten into that applying spiritual principles, you're now in a much bigger arena than just that physical by the letter. Paul goes on, verse 17. Notice this, therefore, 
Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. Again, that's from verse 50, chapter 52 of Isaiah, verse 11 that I read here a little while ago to Israel. We're seeing that Paul is using the same words that were spoken to ancient Israel because the message to Israel, physical, a physical nation call out, was the same message to us, the church, the saints of God, those that we call ourselves at times spiritual Israel. The same message. One message, always. Be you separate. Be different. Don't like the things of the world around you. I'll say something about that here in a moment. Verse 18, back to 2 Corinthians 6, verse 18. I will be a father to you. And you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. And this is a message that Paul is going back to, pulling those same words from God to Moses to Israel to use them to the church at Corinth. Because Corinth had all these problems and sins. Corinth wanted to be like the world around them. The church at Corinth wanted to be like the world around them. And if any of us loves the world or anything in the world, as the scriptures tell us, then we are already on an errant path away from God. Every time we take one step, one step, one step away from God is one step too many. One step away from God is one step too many. Two steps, three steps, four steps, you're getting into big trouble now. And when we walk away from God, we are in the most dire danger zone. It's when we decide to walk away from him. And I don't think a one of you in this room hopefully would ever think in your minds that I would walk away from God. No one ever planned to walk away from God. How does it happen? It happens by increments of time and things happening in your life. And you making compromises and all that I could go into and time won't allow me. We don't leave God overnight. We tend to leave God in Christ through those decisions that we make as we begin to make decisions that satisfy the personal desires of the flesh. If you open, look at chapter 7, verse 1. Therefore, Paul says, writes, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. When I read that, to cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. That means I cannot sit down to a good plate of pork or ham. I grew up in the South. I never had a plate of catfish yet. Because I grew up in this church. I grew up in this way of life. I had people tell me that God called them when they were an adult. And they said, I sure did like that catfish. They couldn't eat the catfish anymore. God says, you don't touch anything unclean physically and most of all spiritually. Don't touch. And we're like little children sometimes, are we not? We just got to, we just got to try it. We just got to try it. We remember the old advertisement, give it to Mikey, he'll eat anything. Remember that old advertisement long ago? Give it to Mikey, he'll eat anything. Sometimes we ingest things in a spiritual diet. That makes us very unhealthy. You're there. Turn back to 1 Corinthians 6. 1 Corinthians 6. And I'm sorry. I, 1 Corinthians 5. 1 Corinthians 5. You talk about. Injunctive instruction to a church. The Apostle Paul wasn't timid. The Apostle Paul was very bold. In what he told. And said to the church at Corinth. Chapter 5. 1 Corinthians. I won't go through those verses. Starting verse 1 of chapter 5. Verse 1 down through there. About where the man was having his father's wife. And Paul had to do a lot of heavy chastising of the church. And to get that leaven out of the church. This is open sin in the church. Get it out. Get that sin. Remove it. Drop down to verse 9. Paul says to the church, I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people. 
Yet I certainly did not mean with the sexually immoral people of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or idolaters, since then you would need to be, go out of the world. But now I have written to you to not keep company with anyone named a brother who is a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a reviler, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, not even to eat with such a person. Brother, I think you know what that's saying. Someone in the church that is openly sinning, practicing sin, willingly practicing sin, or even can be, will not give up a certain sin or habit or addiction, you name it. And Paul says, you are not even to have anything to do with that person until what? They repent. And we pray for their repentance. And Paul says, I didn't mean those people of that those transgressions in the world. Elsewise, you would have to go out of the world. I was in the building construction uh, trades for decades. I was out there, as I've said many times, I was out there with some of the most raw of men. And they didn't care what they spouted off from their mouth. I gave that sermon about the tongue two weeks ago here. Men that own that job, construction sites, they don't care what they say. And they'll say any and everything. And you know what? I couldn't go out from them. I had to work around them. I had to try to keep my, I see one of you grinning back there. I had to learn to adapt. I had to learn to live in that world. And so do you. But Paul is addressing that in the church, these things are not to be. And Paul is saying, you deal with them. Just like in those first verses of chapter five, if you're not dealing with that problem, when I get there, I will deal with it. There are times as a pastor, I have no choice but to deal with an issue or problem in a congregation that I pastor. And it's never pleasant. You want honesty from me? Your former pastor, Mr. Dobson, and I had a conversation a number of years ago. And he said to me, I don't like confrontation. I says, I don't either. But who does? But sometimes, you know, Mr. or Dave, we have to deal with it. There are times we have to. And it's never pleasant. Is it pleasant for God to deal with us in chastening? Does it give God joy to chasten us? Think about that. Does it give a father, a physical father, joy to chasten his child? Now the joy comes later. Hebrews 12 goes into that. I won't go there. Hebrews 12 talks about that ch chastening is not pleasant in the moment. But later it yields that peaceable joy because you have fruit that is supposed to come from being chastened. Well, some people don't like to be corrected. Some people don't like to be chastened. And I've run into that too. Covered that. I wanted to cover those verses. Um, I want to quote. I said earlier, a man that lived in a society where his soul was vexed every day. I'll quote 2 Peter 2, verse 7 and 8. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 7 and 8. Verse 7. He delivered righteous Lot, who was oppressed with the filthy conduct of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. As Lot witnessed the evil, wickedness, Sinful nature, sinful ways of those cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. We don't know how long he lived in it. But he had to live in that world. And his soul was vexed by it. And you know what happened? God removed him and his wife and two daughters. And you know, hopefully the rest of the story, as the old cliche goes. And they were told not to even look back as God delivered them. And Lot's wife looked back. And was turned to a pillar of salt. A minister long ago made the comment. Maybe it did happen that way. Maybe she didn't just look back. Maybe she actually had turned to go back. But we know that the scripture says she looked back. And God had said don't even look back. And she was turned to a pillar of salt. Why? As a memorial. As a testimony. To those of future times. That would see that salt statue of salt. That's Lot's wife. She looked back. See, we've been called. We cannot go back. We have no bridge to the past to go back to. 
We can only go forward. As James says in chapter 4, verse 4. James 4, verse 4. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. There's not a whole lot I can add to that. James was very plain spoken, very bold. What is friendship with the world? Ask yourself in the moment, what is friendship with the world? I can answer it in my mind real quickly. It is wanting to be like the world. It is wanting to do those things which the world does. It's wanting to be a part of their party. This world is having one big party right now, but this party is not going to last forever. This party will have a rude ending to it one day. Just as the Titanic hit that iceberg and the party was over. And the ship sank within a little more than two hours. God says to us, come out of her, my people. What does that mean to you and I? What, is, what does it mean when God says, be separate? Be a holy people unto me. What does it mean to be holy? I think hopefully most of us by now as adults certainly should understand what it means to be holy. It means to be like God. It means to pursue those ways that are like God. To become as he is to ask for his righteousness because it is only by and through his righteousness in us that we will one day grow to the point that we will be one day ready for eternal life when he brings that opportunity and puts in front of us when Christ comes back. Turn to John 17. John, the gospel. John 17. We find maybe the most Powerful, profound prayer in the Bible. If you know of a prayer given in the Bible, more profound, more memorable than this prayer by Jesus Christ on that night, no doubt before he was to be crucified, I'd love to know where it is. This is the prayer of a man that was about to die, be tortured, condemned, tortured, and die by crucifixion. And he gave this prayer and I want to just drop down to verse 14, right into the middle of it. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. We're seeing that same language as Paul said there to church at Corinth. I didn't mean that you would go out of the world, because that's not possible right now. But that you what? That Christ prayed a special closing prayer, so to speak, before he was to be crucified. A special closing prayer that the Father in heaven would keep the saints of God protected from the evil one, though living in the world, not of the world, but protected from the world and the evil one. And then you see in verse 16, they are not of the world. That is you and I, brethren, we are not of the world. We're living in the world, but not of the world. Just as I am not of the world. Verse 17, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also may be sanctified by the truth. And then verse 20, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, and they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. So Christ prays to the Father a special prayer for all future saints down to us today, that you will watch over them, that you will protect them, Father. That you will keep them unspotted from the world. Though in the world. Living in this world. This evil world that's getting more evil. But you will protect them against the things that are in the world. A recent Gallup poll. A recent Gallup poll. 70% of Americans are now in favor of same-sex marriage. With same rights as traditional marriages. That's a recent Gallup poll. 
I'll read it once more. 70% of Americans are now in favor of same-sex marriage with same rights as traditional marriages. I had a man in Birmingham after the service last week, and I read this, and he said, do you, do you trust that poll? I said, well, granted, we can take a certain um, exception to certain polls, and we always know that it depends on who did they poll, where did they do the polling. But since it's Gallup, I would say there's much truth to that. I tell you what is true, people are lying down before this onslaught of no morality anymore. No black and white, no moral absolutes. I do see that personally. I see more and more of our people of this nation acquiescing, just going along with these cultural trends that are anti-God. And I do see that, and I think you do too. And it's leading to nothing but ultimate destruction if we do not repent and turn around. The same Gallup poll said 47% are now okay with abortion. 47% are now okay with abortion. 46% are against it. So that means basically if that poll has any validity to believe that we're basically split down the middle even on the heinous crime, murder of abortion. Let them out there spy in the land on what I'm saying. This world is de disintegrating fast. We are now in a time we have entered over the threshold into the time of a type of Sodom and Gomorrah. And when we read and I read about Lot and his spirit being vexed every day by what he saw, is your spirit vexed? Are you is the scenery from your view each day of your life where you're living, from your home, from your neighborhood, is the view of the world looking good? As you look out the window of your place of abode, does everything look like it's headed in the right direction? Or does it look like that the storm is about to dump a whole lot worse weather on us? Secular culture is dictating more and more. Secular culture around us is more and more telling us what we should do. We are seeing people bow down more and more. Our people, the citizens of this nation, we are seeing more and more of our very people that we love in this nation the citizens, the citizens of the nation bow down more and more to the idolatrous ways of what? Two words, resurrected Babylon. We are seeing Babylon being resurrected right in front of our eyes. You see, Babylon never really went away. But we know that in the end time, Babylon has this great resurrection. You might say it that way. And Babylon will once again, for three and a half years, rule the world. I wrote something about that in the column this past Tuesday night. Crisis and the new world order that's coming, and it's coming, and it's probably closer than we realize. And the power brokers are working frantically to bring it together. And they are there. They're behind the scenes. Although I say behind the scenes anymore, they're out front and open anymore about it. It is time for the church to flee to her place of safety. So I'm going to give you the date now that we're going to flee to the place of safety. It is time, though, to flee to her place. I'll give you a chapter to read at an assignment this week, chapter 91 of Psalms. Many of you may have already read it. Chapter 91 of Psalms tells us where our place of safety is. It's under the wings and protection of our loving Father in heaven. Tomorrow's Father's Day. He is the ultimate Father. He is our Abba Father, our Abba Daddy. He is the one that we seek refuge from the storm around us. He is the one, and no matter what your trials are right now, no matter what trial or test you're going through right now, He is your refuge. And Psalms 91, read it again this week. 
That needs to always be there at your beck and call to go back and read it because he is a mighty fortress of those who love him and cherish him and seek to obey him. And that is the flight, the place of safety that I'm talking about. We have to be making a spiritual flight from this world around us at this time. Daniel 12, verse 1, the sermonette was centered around the book of Daniel. Daniel 12, 1 tells us that when that time ahead comes, the time of the times of Jacob's trouble and all this comes about with the beast power for three and a half years, that whole time frame, that will be a time like there has never been before, nor shall ever be again. And it will literally break into all those who are not God loving. Come out of her, my people. Where is that found? The only place, the exact words in scripture. Revelation 18. Go there with me. Revelation chapter 18. A time coming when God's wrath will be poured out. His judgments will come. A time when Babylon has been what? Resurrected. The beast power and the false prophet. Some of the things that I wrote about on Tuesday night. Chapter 18, verse 1 of Revelation. After these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. And he cried madly with a loud voice, saying, Babylon, the great, is fallen, is fallen, and has become a habitation of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. Brethren, when that time ahead comes to its full bloom, so to speak, when the Babylon has its fullest of resurrection once again, the Holy Roman Empire, and when it rises again, and it will be a short time on earth, three and a half years, but it will be such a powerful entity for that three and a half years, it will crush all opposition. And every, every spirit of Satan's, every demon, every evil spirit will be used by Satan, harnessed to use his power along with their power to influence this kingdom for three and a half years. It will be H on earth when it happens. Verse 3. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. And the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. This whole earth right now is becoming more and more wrapped up in the deeds and the actions and the words and the ways of the evil one that Christ spoke of in his prayer. Protect them from the evil one. And we are going to need more and more of God's protection against this evil one who is no doubt in my mind, in my mind, I'm becoming more personally convinced that he has the power. And just like with Job, that God is going to allow Satan probably use more of his power as time goes along until we come to this time. And 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 tells us that Satan... God will allow him to use such vast powers as to work mighty miracles through the false prophet when that time comes. And then we find verse 4. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins and lest you receive of her plagues. A strong warning of a time to come when the saints of that day will be told to come out of her. I ask this today as I close this message. Is that just a message for that time coming? Or are we supposed to be not only hearing those words now ourselves, but heeding those words to now while it is time, while it is time to escape, is to come out of her now, my people. Do not share in her sins and escape the wrath to come.